the tight five. I always, it's only sport about it, Evan Lockton Boy. Yep, we're on tour. Miles, thank you so much again for sitting in the studio. I know you're absolutely spewing and stewing over the real claret and blue villa, giving it to you hard on the weekend. I think there was a 4 1 right up the chutney, wasn't it? Uh, but in all seriousness about the football, too, mate. Um, Bobby Charlton, I know that uh, a huge hero of yours and huge hero of mine, being a Man United fan, and we both got to meet him as well. What a pleasure and a privilege that was. Very sad, Bobby Charlton passing away. Appreciate you sitting in the seat for us, mate, and appreciate you being there all week as we're in Paris, of course, building up to the Rugby World Cup final. It doesn't get better than this, people. Here we are playing our oldest foe, our greatest foe. Was it meant to be? Both sides have lost a match on route to the final. That's the first time that that's ever happened. Is that a significant stat? Well, of course, you know, on this side of the microphone, you do make a lot of something like that. This is the Tide 5, regular feature on iOS, where we go head to head. Five separate sporting topics, all of them connected, obviously, to what's going to happen this particular weekend. And when the bell goes ding, we move quickly on to the next topic. The All Blacks versus RG, was it all a little too easy for us? South Africa versus England. Are the Springboks leg weary after that match and the contests played so far for them in this World Cup? The constant water bottle intruders on the field, the injury breaks, the sit down, the stoppages that we saw between England and South Africa. And is Wayne Barnes going to do something about that this weekend? Speaking of Wayne Barnes, does it really matter who the referee is? I mean, I've got a big list of names here. Is he the guy that most of us think should be doing this final? And does anyone care about the third and fourth place playoff apart from absolutely no one? Kick it off, lock, with All Blacks versus Argentina. It feels like it was a million miles ago now, doesn't it? It really does. You know, but it was actually Friday night here in Paris. We've had a long weekend. I know you've had the Labour weekend off, people, and so forth. We've got to look back at that game, though, because I've watched, that's the 10th, no, 9th All Blacks World Cup semi-final. Yeah, the 9th one. Yeah, yep. And I have never felt... So relaxed, as you heard, you know, during the the very first bit there of the of the show that we actually presented to you when I was in, you know chasing around all these bars around Paris, getting audio and so forth. I never felt so relaxed during a game. I what mean, about, beforehand I was a little bit concerned, but during the game, I mean, the game felt like it was over after twenty five minutes. What about eighty seven when the All Blacks beat Wales? A good point. Thirty nine ten. Good or something point. Was good point. Actually, way. all I can remember from that game is Buck Shelford clocking that guy and knocking him out. When they woke the guy up, they gave him a red card. <laughs> <laughs> Things were a little different then. I think there was yeah, a, yeah, yeah. the Sydney was it the Sydney, was Sydney cricket ground or maybe something like that that they played there. But anyway, yeah, no, that, good point. That was a very relaxed match. I'd actually forgotten about that. But when it comes to World Cup semi-finals, there is stress and tension attached. But there wasn't for this Argentina game. No, um, there was a hint within me pre-game that was, well, this is an All Blacks team that hasn't been able to back up really good wins over the last four years, or if they've backed it up, they then stumble the following week. Um, and yet they, I can't say they were really good because I sat there, I was in the stadium and I sat there and actually I was sitting next to Frankie Davis, a good friend of ours on the show and we were talking quite a bit during the game um, and he, he, was, he was quite amusing, uh, Frankie, every time I started clapping an all-backs try he'd pull my hands away and get a bit annoyed but um, I, I didn't actually feel we were really that great early on, we absorbed a fair bit of pressure and we had a couple of chances and as soon as we did we scored, and I thought, oh, this is easy, we'll run away with it. And then we started to drop the ball, we gave away a couple of penalties, I thought, this is a bit scruffy from us. Uh, and then a couple of tries, either side of halftime, pretty much won us the game. But it, we weren't pushed hard, we weren't the cleanest we've ever been, but when we had chances and we attacked Argentina, uh, whether we threw it out wide or, or, or worked close to the um, close to the breakdown, we, we, we got something every time we tried. We, we weren't tested at all, we didn't really need to get out of second gear. Uh, and the sad thing was, I actually thought, Argentina, I think there was hope that they'd turn up and play and really push the All Blacks in some manner. And I think a lot of All Blacks fans actually would think, we want to be pushed a bit of this game so that we can continue this battle hardening ahead of the World Cup final, assuming we go and win this game. But there was none of that. I thought I actually thought Argentina were very disappointing. I thought some calls went against them that probably shouldn't have, but they were totally um, overpowered in every facet of the game by an All Blacks team that actually wasn't anywhere near their best. It wasn't uh, as mighty a performance as the one against Ireland in the quarterfinal. Um, and I just felt as though, this is great, we're not getting out of second gear, we, we don't need to, we can just walk all over this team, which is a bit strange because we haven't done that to Argentina in a while. Like You'd have to go back to sort of 2012, 13, 14, that period of the All Blacks to actually go back to a time when we would consistently beat Argentina by such a margin. So it was actually quite a shock that they were that bad and, and there was such a gulf between the two teams. 
Um, well, as Chris Jones says, mate, they were like the like seventh ranked team in the world for a reason. I mean, you know, this to me was like watching, you know, the Broncos and Penrith play the Warriors and the Melbourne Storm in the yeah, playoffs, wasn't yeah. it? There was just such a gulf between the two sides. Oh, look, I, I mean, you know, and if you talk about was it a good warm up for a final? Well, was Uruguay, the Seychelles, the Canary Islands, and Stuart Island a good warm up to play England to play Ireland rather in the mm. quarterfinal? And no, no, they weren't. So I'm not too worried about. And to be fair, Ireland's last game before they faced us was Scotland, who supposedly are a very well, mighty should have been foe, the right tuner. You know? So yeah. yeah, I mean, look, you know, we're just arguing around in circles about this. I mean, you know, in the end, it, it was it was a really easy win for the All Blacks. We weren't tested. But as Scott McLeod said at the presser today, probably the best thing to come out of it is the fact we've got 33 fit men, right? And we can yeah. choose. And and, and, and and you know we aren't carrying any injuries and we don't have the kind of attrition rate, which was topic number two. Because when you look at the South African-England game and a couple of key components out of that game for me were the fact that substitutions happened so early. And when you've got a guy like Sia Khaleesi who's brought off so early because he looked tired and leg weary, and how much of the success of tough test matches taken it out of the spring box. They just didn't look as though they were in that game at all. I thought that, you know, England would come to play. And, you know, even before the game, I think I was saying, you know, beware this England side. They've yeah. got a great performance in them. But they didn't play that well, Lachlan. There wasn't a great performance from them. There was a spring box side which had just come down three or four pegs to me. Yeah, it was an England side that up front and in within the first 10 positions essentially was very, very tidy. But outside of that, when you look at the you know their, their ability or lack of ability to spread the ball wide and try and attack South Africa out wide and run them off their feet, which is often a way to beat the Springboks, they didn't do any of that. And it's funny because I was texting you um, and, and I just said this is a powerful England performance and you said 20, you referenced 2019. I think you referenced that in a tweet as well. And it was similar to the way that England beat us in 2019. The difference was... If you go back and look at that game in 2019 and the way that England won that game, they were powerful in the breakdown. They just monstered us in every facet. But when they spread the ball wide, they found gaps and attacked them and kept the ball alive. They didn't do any of that against South Africa in the semi-final. They didn't even venture out wide until the 78th minute when they needed to. And shock. And they dropped they the looked, ball and they fumbled well, the ball. Well, they, they looked so confused. They, they didn't, didn't know, know how to... There was one, yeah, yeah. one of the... I prop, totally agree with I you. I think it was a midfielder who came off the bench and I, his, his name escapes me, but he got the ball... And there was an overlap. They had a three-on-one on their left side, and he just took the ball into the defence and then just went to ground. And I thought, you had them, you had numbers. What are you doing? So they, they didn't know what they were doing, essentially, England, when it came to spring it, spring it, uh, spreading, excuse me, spreading it out wide, which aligns with what Chris Jones has talked about a lot on this show. They have such this boxed-in style of rugby that they don't really do anything outside of running it close to the breakdown and working through their forwards. Um, but what it did to the spring box is that I think... It wore them down enough, or wore down a team enough that had already been worn down by so many tough matches that it took them so long to finally click them together, the Springboks. And all they did was like a penalty that kicked it downfield, and I think they had a great run off a line out and then eventually scored their only, uh, well, the only try in the match off that uh, part, and then obviously got a scrum penalty at the end. So it was 10 points in the last sort of 10 minutes or so. But they didn't look good at all, and they looked like they were being beaten essentially at their own game. You know, set pieces, the breakdown, you know, um, the collisions. They were being beaten in all those departments, which is really strange. And it really bodes well for us, because as much as we, on our day, look good in that department, we're always probably going to be second best when we play the spring box in terms of the physicality. So if they're so worn down that they can't even knock over an English side who have been really poor for about a year, who, to be fair, as we're saying, they played really well in the semi-final England in, in that part of the game, the physical part of the game. Um, that bodes really well for the All Blacks. That, and you look at the fixtures that you listed. You got Scotland, you got Ireland, you got Tonga, you got France and England, and now you've got us. That's such a hard, hard, hard tournament for the Springbok side, who, you know, are big and physical and they're tough men. But at the, at the end of the day, there's going to be a point where you start to drop down a little bit in form. Well, our fear was always, wasn't it, before the tournament of winning back to back to back yeah. in 15 days. Now, we're quite lucky that we've had that Ireland game, but if we'd played Ireland, then say had to play France maybe in mm. the semi-final and then go into the Springboks, I'd be really worried about about the yeah. state of our guys. But the fact that we've actually had one big game against France, three training runs, a big game against Ireland, and effectively, well, it was an easy game against Argentina. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and so therefore, when we go in remarkably fresh compared to the other teams, you, I mean, I, I just don't see how you can assess it any other way than that. No, and you look at all the World Cup winners, you can look at South Africa versus England like this in the last World Cup, and as I say, you look at the World Cup winners of the last pretty much every tournament. The team that's won has had one knockout game 
that has been a bit of a walk in the park compared to the rest. Last World Cup, South Africa had Japan and then a very average yeah, Wales, Wales side. side. That's right. Whereas England had Australia, then us, yeah. and then they had to uh, front up against South Africa. World Cup before, we absolutely destroyed France in that quarterfinal because we were just leaps and bounds better than them. 2011, we had Argentina in the quarterfinals who weren't yeah, as right. good as Australia okay. or, yeah. or what France yeah, turned right. out to be. 07, yeah. South Africa had Argentina and Fiji. Um, not in that order, sorry. Fiji then Argentina. That's so right. You go through all of the World Cups, the team that has won it has had at least one really easy knockout game. South Africa haven't because that England game when you watch it was a tough game for them and now they've got to play us. So that's good surely going to um, come back to bite them in the what arse. What happens with the world rugby and this investigation into Bongi and and you know allegedly what he said I'll, t- I'll tell you right now what's going to happen I think that it gets lost in translation and the explanations that we have had whether it's Afrikaans or whether it's a misinterpretation of what was said and whether he was actually commenting on the left or the right side of the scrum and whether I, just, I don't actually think he's going to be suspended and miss this do you think he's going to miss the final well do they have a, a hooker outside of him yeah, they've got a couple, as Chris Jones said, of guys who, I mean, I can't even remember what their names are. I mean, this guy's their number yeah. one guy. I mean, he's, and he actually makes a huge difference when he's on the field. I mean, that last scrum was absolutely enormous from them against England. But it's it would be such a huge call for world rugby on the back of Tom Curry not wanting to talk about it to say, hey, that this was said, this is what it means, and therefore you're going to miss a World Cup final. That would be massive. I guess it depends how severe the slur was and what they're suggesting it was. Well, they're suggesting that he called him a white C. A white C word, yeah. which, okay. Okay. which personally, being devil's advocate, if I was called that in a rugby field, I wouldn't care. See, I would just wave it off and go, I well, wouldn't give I a would stuff. Wave. But you see, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a 50-something-year-old man, and I'd wave it off and I'd go, so what? Yeah. I know that there's a lot of people around who are probably listening to that going, oh my God, that's disgusting, you can't say that. It's on a bloody rugby field. Yeah. You've got two guys 120k running into each other and butting heads. Let them sort it yeah. out and leave it where it is. I hope World Rugby do that. Let's move on to Wayne Barnes. Does it really matter who the ref is? Angus Gardner, I thought, and I've had some great Twitter war arguments with people about his performance Performance between you know in the match between us and the and, and Argentina, I thought he was absolutely awful actually, and uh, you know and and the counter argument to that Whoa. two two other sets of eyes are sitting there saying it was brilliant. We can't have Ben O'Keefe because he can't ref the final. Um, you the 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 guy Yako Piper did his calf. Yeah. The guy that that's re- a, that, that's the end of discussion. Okay, There's only three referees who uh, could do so it. So it had to be Wayne Barnes. It's yeah. got to be now, Wayne Barnes. I quite I actually quite like Nick Berry, who um, I don't know what his story is because he, he I don't think he's done a knockout game. Well, Berry. all the Aussies left. Oh no, that's right, Angus Gardner stayed. Yeah. <laughs> but um, I didn't think Angus Gardner had that bad a game. I think there was a call where like, in the first half something around about a kick that got touched and it went. They said it was out over here, but it was actually out over there where I think the TMO got it wrong and was in his ear and whatnot. There was a couple of calls that went against Argentina that were a bit of a shame. One advantage went on for ages for the All Blacks, and one didn't go on for very long at all for Argentina. But other than that, I thought Angus Gardner was I just fine think for the most part. I just for a World Cup final. I just I want a guy that lets... The two well, guys that I would want are Barnes and O'Keefe. Well, I ben want O'Keefe, the game. Well, I mean, if you're going to say Angus Gardner had a shock, Ben O'Keefe hasn't exactly had, had the best last couple of games. But this is the thing I hate about... Refer- I hate making discussions out of referees because as long as you're good enough on the day, the referee shouldn't come into it. Every single referee in every single sport at some point or another is going to make a mistake. And we always focus on the yes, mistakes. We do. They yes, will make we do. two mistakes out of 120 yes, decisions. We do. Yes, we and do. those two mistakes make all the headlines. And all of a sudden, they're a bad ref because they might have missed well, two no, calls out not, of 120. It's not, it's not a bad ref. I just want the game to flow. Okay, there are two things. I, two things that I want. I just want the game to be a great game of rugby. I don't want any cards or yellow or red cards or anything to well, actually well, be. Well, what if a red card is warranted? Well, if it's, a, if it's warranted, the players are dumbass if that's exactly. the case. Send them off. Okay. Yeah, he's got to be sent off. And the other thing I don't want, which is our final topic, is I don't want these goons coming onto the field with a bib on and a water bottle in their hand, stopping play and getting involved in the game. Now, this is a blight on the NRL, and I've talked about it forever. The only time that one of those guys should be on the field is an injury break invited by the referee. The rest of the time, get off. You're not the Look, the players yeah. are sucking up air into their lungs. You're not there to give them a squirt of water. That's not what the game is. You get a water at half time is what you do. If you're too thirsty, get substituted and get off the goddamn field then. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, you know, it's just it's it's so annoying to me. It's very annoying. It never used to be this bad of a thing in rugby. It's always it's always been really like there was an NRL grand final I think it was 219 within, between the Roosters and the Raiders and the Roosters put a kick in or the Raiders put a kick in and it hit one of the water boys 
who was on the oh, field. Brilliant, but brilliant. he wasn't doing anything. But it hit him, and it, it, it's, I think it was the Raiders put a kick in, and the kick didn't go down the field, and it gave the Roosters really good uh, field position for the next set. And the ref kind of said, "Oh, sorry, I can't really make a call there." He could have, but because the, the water boy got in the way. Yeah, it's 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 it is. I agree with you absolutely. It's a blight on the game. Um, and it really hasn't seemed to have been as much of an issue until this World Cup. Like rugby, never really seemed to have an issue um, where these guys would get on the field and just stay there and slow down the game. The NRL has for a long time, but um, again, I, I'd like to think that Wayne Barnes would step in and sort of. This is he's the most experienced ref in the world, isn't he? Yeah, I think he's the in, best guy to call it. I mean, after Wayne for, Barnes after 2007, he's the bef, best ref. He is, he's and, and he's ref. also, because of his maturity and his experience, I don't think he'd take much nonsense. And I also would like to think that Wayne Barnes understands what the players, the teams, and what the fans will want as well, and he'll keep it going. Devlin. Down goes Frazier! Down goes Frazier! The Platform.